Good evening. Let's pray God's blessing over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you that uh, you just give us this place to worship, Lord. Thank you that you give us a place to hear your word. Um, I pray that it change. I pray that you open our minds, Lord, to receive it today, Lord. I thank you that you give us the ability to give, Lord, and I just pray it's all towards the advancement of your kingdom. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You may support the church financially by any of these options in person as the ushers go around, or place an offering box posted on the side of the sanctuary. Text the word GIVE to 215-515-6552. Send checks to P.O. Box 30750, Philadelphia, PA, 19104. Secure online giving, please visit ccwordoflife.org and click Giving. Forever Mentored Boys Group will meet on Thursday, March 28th at 7 p.m. at the 16th Street location. Please join us for weekday midday prayer, which will be starting on Friday, March 29th at 12 p.m. at the Germantown location. Good Friday Communion and Family Night will be held on Friday, March 29th at 7.30 p.m. Please see Charlene Abrams if you'd like to bring a potluck dish. Join us on Easter Sunday, March 31st, for 10 a.m. or 12, 15 p.m. service as we continue to study the Bible together verse by verse. To watch the live stream or recording of the message, go to ccwordoflife.org, then click the word. The live stream will start after the worship. Prayer service will be canceled on Sunday evening. The men's fellowship slash prayer group will be canceled on Monday, April 1st. The next men's brunch will be held on Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. All men are invited to attend. Please see Herman R.C. for details. Women's Fellowship will be meeting on Friday, April 26 at 7.30 p.m. All ladies are invited to attend. See Sarah Darden for more information. If you have a birthday in the month of April and would like to have your name added to the birthday list, please leave details at the information table. If you have a prayer request, you may send it to ccwordoflife.org then click prayer or submit your request in the prayer box in the sanctuary. For all announcements, go to ccwordoflife.org and click updates or use the QR code on the screen. Now please silence your phones and turn with us in the Bibles as we study Hebrews 12 uh, verses one and two. Or chapter, yeah, <laughs> Hebrews 12 verses one and two. Good evening, church. And I thought that we would, um, don't forget, Friday, we have a service, communion service. It's Good Friday. It's going to be a lot of food, a lot of fellowship, a lot of um, music, a lot of worship, a lot of prayer, a lot of fellowship. So make sure you be here. A detour from Second Chronicles, we'll pick back up next week, um, chapter 8 and 9. But this week, I want to do Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to look at this um, portion of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for another day, Lord, um, you've given us, Lord, and we're so blessed to come and be able to worship you, Lord, um, to praise you. To look to you, Lord, and know that, Lord, you're the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would um, speak to us tonight, Lord, that we, we need um, a fresh reminder of who you are, Lord, a, a fresh reminder of looking at the cross, a fresh reminder of the things that you do for us and the things that you've given us. And the race that you place before us, Lord, um, to run with diligence, Lord, and putting our hand to the plow and never looking back. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray, teach us the things we don't know and the things that we do, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, that they come to life for us. 
As we study this passage tonight, Lord, I'm, Lord, we love you, Lord, we honor you, we praise you in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I wanted to get a, a framework for Friday because Friday we're going to look at Christ hanging on a cross. So Christ will die on a cross. But it's interesting with the rite of Hebrews rite, and, and, and remember that when you read Hebrews chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 11, he's kind of like, he's going into like this from one place of those who had faith in the Lord, and he says, therefore, because he starts verse 1 of chapter 12 with, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, speaking of those witnesses that he mentioned in chapter 11, all those different names he mentioned from, you know, Enoch to Abraham to Abel to Noah to um, Sarah to, um, you know, and, you know, the list goes on to Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joseph. And then he just gets overwhelmed and he starts mentioning all these names, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophet and so forth. And then those testimonies he would write out about what they did. Some of the guys, they quenched the, you know, the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong, became violent in battle, turned to flight the armies of the, the aliens, and women received their dead, raised to life again. All these miracles that Elijah and Elijah did. And the writer just sums all this stuff up. But when he gets to chapter 12, it's interesting that he says, looking unto Jesus, and he goes, you know, is, he says, therefore, we, uh, we also, since we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us uh, and snares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, and you look at that verse, he says, and he, and he you know, verse 2, he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It says he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, in the New Testament, the word cross the Old Testament doesn't talk about the cross, like the cross that Jesus died on. It says the word crossed with the ED, crossed over or whatever. But in the New Testament, the word cross is mentioned or either alluded to about 41 times. 41 times, 28 times in the Gospels. Mark mentions the cross the most, once in the book of Acts, 11 times in Paul's letters, the epistles, and once in the book of Hebrews. Once in the book of Hebrews, the writer talks about Christ, but he says, endured the cross. You know, the cross was a shameful way of dying, so Christ endured the cross. It's interesting that when you think about what was that cross made of? You know, he said, well, they had these crosses, but, you know, I was reading, I said, some writers, the tradition says it was made out of pine wood, which is a very durable wood. Some say cypress wood and others say cedar wood. Likely one of the three is right. You know, pine wood may be one. And, and the cross, when was it event, invented? You know, you think about, well, who in the world started a cross in the first place? That, that Look, that, remember the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Persians, who was the more affluent or more dominant out of the two, Medo-Persians, the Persians, Artaxerxes, Xerxes, Ahasuerus, uh, uh, all those different names, or Xerxes the second, and our, you know, all those. The Persian Empire may have been the first to hang people on something like a similar to a, a gala. Ezra chapter six eleven talks about it. Maybe they were the first ones, but they were hanged on gallows, hung on gallows. In the book of, remember Esther chapter 2, verse 23? Esther chapter 5, I, I believe it's verse 14, but it's what Mordecai was hung on those gallows that he set up for, you know, um, I mean, not Mar Haman, rather, was hung up on those gallows that he tried to get Mordecai hung on. He was end up being hanged on those, you know, so they had a sense of something similar to like hanging somebody. 
We know the Jews said that if somebody was hung on a tree, their body should be taken down, shouldn't hang overnight in, in Deuteronomy 21. So we know that. But this cross was something that was a horrible way to die. You, you couldn't imagine it. You know, because you think about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, he didn't live that long. You know, believe it or not, he died at the age of about 32 in Babylon in 323 B.C. But nine years before his death, he used this natural sandbar, you know, to build this causeway. Some say he built the causeway, allowing his army to overwhelm Tyre, the island portion of it, the stronghold, during the siege in 332 B.C., Archaeologists never understood how he managed to build a viable water over water passage to reach the enemy. They don't know how he did it. He was a genius in regards to war and strategies. He was a genius. Because Nebuchadnezzar II tried 13 years to try to get this, because Tyre was the, the inland part of Tyre, which is modern day Lebanon, and now in the um, sea of the Mediterranean Sea, they had an island out there that they left all their treasures and all their wealth and everything. Nebuchadnezzar never got there. 13 years he tried. Alexander the Great builds a causeway, goes in there, takes everything, destroys everything, but something else he did. He crucified 2,000 people. 2,000 people were crucified. 2,000 people. And look, it's been noted that the Jewish ruler, Alexander Janaeus, his Hebrew name was Jonathan Janaeus, who was both, and they, they always didn't like him, the Pharisees hated him, because he was both the king of Judea and he was also the high priest. And it was from 103 B.C. to about 76 B.C. He was the, the king and the high priest. You know, the Pharisees opposed him at Bethom. He crucified 800 Pharisees. You imagine an 800 Pharisees crucified. 800. Remember Hannibal? Hannibal was one of the world's most famous generals, the Carthian, the Carthage army, the Carthage, Carthage army. He achieved what the Romans thought was impossible, with a vast army, thirty thousand troops, fifteen thousand horses, and you know what he had? If you ever look at some of those old things, it's real funny. He had thirty-seven elephants in the front of his military with these metal frames around their face, and you can see the elephants. They were like tanks. He had thirty-seven elephants. He crossed over the Mahdi Alps only 16 days to launch an attack on Rome or from the north. However, during the days of Hannibal, crucifixion was established, was an established mode of execution, which could have even been imposed on generals for suffering major defeat. If you was a general and you suffered a major defeat, you was crucified. You know, notorious mass crucifixions followed the third civil or servile war that lasted from 7, 73 to 71 BC, the slave rebellion under Spartacus. About 6,000 of his followers was crucified along the uh, Apanian Way between um, Capua and Rome. 6,000 people were crucified. Could you imagine that? 6,000. The Romans, when they, you know, Titus Vespasian, the Roman army, when they destroyed Jerusalem in AD 7, 70 AD, it says that they crucified about 1,000 Pharisees. I guess that's why when you read Acts 6, 7, it says many of them came to the faith. I guess they did. About 1,000 of them was crucified. Flavius Josephus recognized some of his friends. Some as his friends, three were taken down, but only one survived. Three of them was up there. They were taken down from the cross, but only one of them survived. So crucifixion was perfected by the Romans. You imagine that? This big wooden, and who would they put to death? In Rome, re rebellious, slaves, bandits, rarely would they crucify a Roman citizen. That's why Paul 
didn't get crucified. Paul got beheaded. He was a Roman citizen. They didn't crucify Roman citizens lest they had some type of thought of, you know, creating some type of insurrection or something. But for the most part, a Roman citizen wasn't crucified. Wasn't crucified. And usually when a person who was crucified, what would they die from? They would, you know, they would lose enough blood to die. Hypovolemic shock. You could write, write, you know, break that word down in this sense. Hypo, hooper means up, hypo means under, under, and it has the word hypo and a V O L, volumes, emic blood, low volumes of blood, hypo, hypovolemic shock. You lose enough blood, you will go into shock. Hypovolemic shock. Or they would have a ruptured, what we call a ruptured periocardium sac. The periocardium sac is where the fluids, you know, fills the sac that surrounds the heart and the roots of the major blood vessels that extend to your heart or from your heart. And that would rupture or you would suffocate. Think about what Christ went through, and that's the whole point of saying this. That Christ would have went through all this stuff. You know, they would take those spikes about this big and they would go like this. And they would nail them through your wrists. The crossbar that they carried, the, the patulaba, uh, the patabulum. You know, the patabulum would be about 100, between 75 and 125 pounds. So if you take that and plus the stipe that stood at the place where they took the crossbar and hoisted you up, it, the cross itself weighed about 300 pounds. Could you imagine somebody taking you and taking this big block of wood and putting you against the wood and just start nailing your, your and then your feet would go sideways. They would nail right through your feet. I wish I, I didn't want to bring the pictures because I would have scared some of y'all after death. But it's, you know, it goes sideways. They went on their feet sideways and some got the, the, um, the nail going straight through their feet sideways. Because they would twist your body like this and you would try to hoist up and get air because you couldn't really breathe. You would suffocate almost to death. And it was a horrible way of dying. A horrible way of dying. A horrible way of dying. And I just couldn't imagine. The, the, I wouldn't want to work for Rome because imagine crucifying 6,000 people. That's a lot of work. And it would take like four to six guys to hold them down. You know, because people wouldn't just like do it willingly. If you know you're going to die, you're going to fight. They'd be going, someone would get clubbed in the head. You know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Most victims never made it to the crucifixion site because they bled out. The back, I got a picture of, of, of uh, the back of a crucified victim. If you want to see it after church, let me know. It's like you just see the skeleton remains and just blood all around it. And then the flesh on the sides. Because they would be, be beaten with a flagellum. The flagellum was this leather strap. It had, you know, metal ribbons in it wrapped in there. It had um, these, um, it ripped all the skin off your back. Every, you, 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 you had all the skin ripped off your back. Imagine that. And you said, well, I'm here tonight, man. I love the Lord. Man, the Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And, you know, you just think about the cross itself. You know, what does that really entail when you think about the cross? Could you imagine if they said that we didn't do right, they were crucifiers? It wasn't until Constantine came in as the Roman emperor that they stopped crucifixion. It was years later. It still continued for some years until he came in. I think he came like 325 B.C., somewhere around there. I may be wrong about that, but we realize this. Crucifixion was a horrible way to die. And how big is this cross? It weighed 300 pounds total. In some cases, you had to carry that crossbar. Could you imagine after Christ got beaten, he had to carry that crossbar? That's why most people don't like looking at the Passion movie no more. Most people cannot stand looking at the Passion movie. They can't stand it. They can't look at it. And that one scene when that Roman, so-called Roman soldier, was he was an actor, but when he swung that flagellant and it stuck in his back, 
and he ripped it out and all the blood went everywhere. And the other one, they just stuck near his head. I just, you know. The Bible says he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Think about that. Think about all the pictures that you could imagine in your mind for some way to die for, for somebody to die for you. I would never, ever picture it being a cross. I would say gas chambers, firing squad, lethal injection. Why couldn't Christ been born around this time? Had modern ways of putting people to death. Why, you know, the particular, you know, things that we see and, and, and the things that we, we, we know of that's horrible. Why would it, why would it have to be that? Why, you know, why would it have to be this bloody thing this, that happened to our Lord? Why would it have to be so much bloodshed? Why would it have to be that? Why couldn't it be another way? Why wasn't it another way, God? Why, you know, why did you have to let your son die like this? And every blood of the, you read Hebrews, every lamb that was sacrificed in the Old Testament was pointing to the blood of Christ. Every lamb, every sinner that came, the sinners was the worshiper. They were guilty, not the animals they brought to the priest. The animal was innocent and he died in the place of the person in the sense for their person's sin they didn't commit any sin the animal the, and that animal they would take the entrails out cut it all up into pieces it would be a monstrosity to look at it looked nothing like the animal they brought to the priest nothing like the animal that they brought to the priest and it's the same prophecy of what would happen to the Lamb of God. John the Baptist in John chapter 1 verse 29 said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. It's the same exact thing because Isaiah 52 14 says that his visage was marred more than any. So his face was disfigured. When Christ was beaten, he didn't look like a person. He didn't look anything like the Lamb of God. He looked like a monstrosity to look upon. And that was all a foretype or a foreshadowing of what would happen to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, dying on the cross. Why the cross? People said, well, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, let this cup pass me. If it's possible, you know, let, you know, thinking that it would, that's not what he was talking about. Because remember, he told his disciples, no man taketh my life. I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down, the power to take it up again. This is, the, 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 you know, what I receive from my father. I, 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 I can lay it down, laying it up on my own volition, my own will. But I have the power to raise it up again. It says God the Father raised Jesus up. It says the Holy Spirit raised him up. The Trinity was working in his resurrection. But before all of that, Christ went to the cross. For you and I, everybody sitting in this room tonight, he died on a cross for our sins and we were all sinners separated from God and Christ came in. It was the God-man who was the advocate for us and the only mediator between man and God. It was Jesus Christ, the man, the son of God. 100% man, 100% God. He died in your place and in my place. And if you forget the cross, you forget everything. Because you'll start thinking that it's something you bring to the table when the table was already set. We sing that song, When I Survey the Wonderful Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. It was a wonderful cross, but we have a hard time enduring even watching what happened to him or reading about it. Early this morning, me and Charlotte was reading Philippians 2. And it says, he made himself of no reputation, taken on the form of a bondservant, coming in a likeness of man. He didn't even consider Robert to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation. And he was obedient to the point, even to the point of death, the death on the cross. Paul gives us this great Christology of the doctrine of who Jesus Christ is in Philippians 2. It's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible in regards to who Christ is. Meek and lowly. He died on the cross. And so the writer of Hebrews says, I want y'all to kind of get a picture. 
He said, therefore, we, now he includes himself in verse 1, we, and he's going to say we twice and us four times in this verse, including himself and, uh, and what is written. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded, which means to lie around. In some places in the Bible, it means to hang. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, referring from Abel to Samuel, all those in between, and, and others mentioned, not by name, but mentioned about what they did, let us lay aside... It means to throw in off of everything and anything that would hold you down or impede progress or encumber your progress. Look in the Greek culture, it was the custom of a runner to strip off his clothes before running in the race. This is, a, in a spiritual sense, is, is a radical move for all who were, have followed Jesus Christ by faith. They had to be stripped. You got to be stripped of yourself and lay aside yourself. They would strip off their clothes in the Grecian culture and they just start running with almost down to like their shorts or something, you know, and they just run and they stripped off everything that could impede their progress. And you know, anything might run in track. They tell you, don't look back. Whatever you do, don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Just keep your gaze forward to the finish line because any other way you look will impede your progress and somebody will pass you. And he says, this greater cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. They were looking forward to the cross. And let us lay aside every weight. The runner in a race would wear weights in practice while training, I don't know if you remember, years ago we used to have ankle weights. They put lead in them, they would tie them around your legs, and you would run in them. And then when you took them off, you were faster. Your legs moved faster. But never while running a race did you wear those weights because it would slow you down. And the weight would become a burden and a load. You know, one Greek grammar is stated, every encumbrance. Lay aside every encumbrance. To encumber means to hinder or impede. And, and we are faced with oh, oh, weights every day within our Christian journey. Every, in your Christian walk, it's a weight every single day. Every day you live is going to be some kind of barrier, some weight, some landmine, something that you look back and say, well, what in how in the world did this happen to me? I wasn't even thinking it. And bam, and this happened. And man, I mean, it's a weight every single day. Something tries to stop our progress. Did you know that? Something is trying to stop our progress, even while we're sitting here. Something trying to stop your progress. You know, remember the sow and the seed parable? When it says that the third response that, you know, they fell among the, thir the, the thorns. And says those are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire, desires, plural, for other things entering, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That's the enemy's job to hinder you. Who hindered you? Paul told the churches in Galatia, who bewitched you? Have we begun in the spirit and now being made perfected in the flesh? Said, who bewitched you? Who stopped you from following the Lord? How'd you get saved? Well, I got saved when I was by myself, and the Lord touched my heart, and I cried out for the Lord to forgive me of my sins. And, and here I am. I love the Lord. I go to church. And then all of us, you get to church. You get along with the wrong crowd. They all going to the movies every Friday. Or you used to go street witnessing every Friday. They all want to go to the beach. And when you used to be out every day somewhere trying to feed the homeless. And that's how we receive whatever you started off with. Try to keep the momentum. Is anything wrong with the beach? No. Is anything wrong with the movies? No. But if that becomes your only means of living, that's when it becomes a major problem. That's when it becomes a major problem. Who impeded you? It could be you marrying the wrong person. Or it could be you, you know, I've seen this one, this one girl said, you know, I think I married the wrong guy. I said, well, how do you know that? 
She said, because I used to always be at church. I used to always just do things for the Lord. I was on the choir. I helped with the kids' ministry. I helped with this and I helped with that. And I get married and I can't do those things no more. What are you doing in your spare time? Well, we don't do nothing but go out in the restaurants and do, you know, you, you can, look, if you're looking to get married, look at the fruit that the person had before you marry them. Don't try to mix their fruit in with yours and say, oh, eventually we'll be one tree. It don't work like that. He said, what fruit are they bearing, you know, without me? That Do they go to Bible study? Do they love the Lord? What are they doing for Jesus without me? Because if they're not, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> it's going to stop your progress. And he says, lay aside every weight. Remember when Paul told those sailors when they were going to take them to Rome, he says, look, there's going to be a storm coming. It was called a Eurocliton. Almost like a cyclone or something. They didn't listen to Paul. Paul said, y'all got to start throwing stuff overboard. But then they finally start realizing they start throwing stuff overboard. But why did they throw stuff overboard? To make it lighter so they can get to their destination. Like the same sailors in the story of Jonah. They started throwing cargo and everything overboard. Then they said, here's the real problem. They threw Jonah overboard. Them guys got saved, too, on that boat. They got saved. They said, we believe in the God of Israel. Help us, you know. We have to throw away everything that can stop progress. You got to realize that? Because if you don't throw it away, you won't take up your cross daily and follow the Lord. The cross won't mean nothing to you. It really won't. It won't mean anything to you. It would just be a story in the Bible. Well, all the Gospels mention it, you know. Mark mentions it, you know. Mark 15, and, you know, Luke mentions it, Luke 23, and, you know, and John mentions it in John 19, and, you know, Matthew mentions it in Matthew 27, and, you know, I know the cross story. Those are all those chapters that they mention it. And, you know, yeah, I know the cross story. Jesus died on the cross, but I'm saved. And forget all about the cross and it becomes all about your dreams and your aspirations and all the things you want to be in. It had nothing to do with Jesus. You say, ask somebody, what's your goals in Jesus? They look at you, what do you mean goals in Jesus? What do you mean, what, I got goals for myself. I mean, in your Christian journey, what are your goals? Most people can't even tell you. Because they don't have any goals to be more like Christ. Most people is not walking around saying, you know, I'm going to get rid of this because it's going to make me look more like Christ. I'm going to get rid of this because it's going to make me look more like, I'm going to get rid of, you know, putting those things which are behind and I'm going to go forward in Christ. I'm looking at my whole, no, no, I'm going to trust in him. Those who keep their mind stayed on him will be in perfect peace because they trust in him. And your whole life become Boom, you people say, well, how are they f running this race? They passing the guys that that been in the race for years. And you just, you're the new kid on the block and you're running past all of them. Why? Because you're willing to lay, lay aside every weight. That's why when you first get saved, it seems like you got so much momentum because you're willing to weigh, you know what I'm talking. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? you want willing to lay aside everything. Say, I, I'm done with those friends, man. If Jesus saved me, you're crying, I don't care. I don't need no man. I don't need nothing. I just need Jesus. That lasts not too long. When the cute guy walking, hey, well, maybe I do want to get married now. That don't last that long. And every way, and he says, and the sin. Notice that he says, the sin, definite article, the particular sin, which so easily ensnares, and the word means to entangle us. He says, let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us waits that lead us into sin. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. Those are the three categories of the weights that leads us in, you know, into sin. He says, lay aside every weight. He says, and the sin. The sin. The one thing that you have a hard time having victory over, that thing. Lay it aside. Lay it aside. Lay it aside. 
Look, when we desire and constantly crave for carnal things, we look away from Jesus and the cares of this world can overtake us, followed by the temptation where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life has victory over our lives and we become defeated and the race seems impossible for us to compete and to complete and to even compete and complete. Look, to compete in something, you got to complete it. Sometimes we have a hard time after a certain point of our Christian life to compete in the race, not even, let alone complete it. Let alone complete it. However, the sin that the writer may be alluding to is the sin of doubt and unbelief which hinders our faith and lays a weight on our hearts, impeding our faith lest otherwise we absolutely and confidently place our faith in Christ and run the race with endurance, only in Christ can we do it. That's what he's talking about. Because the key word is endurance. And, and it means to remain under, to in, in steadfastness, especially as God enables the believer to remain under the challenges he allots in our life. He allots challenges in our life. Do you know that? He allows things to happen in our life. And it's only a test. It's not temptation, it's a test. Remember John chapter 6. It says he himself knew what he was going to do in John chapter 6. It was a test. All of us have different lanes, but the same course to complete. Every last one of us. You got different lanes, but the same course to complete. Different lanes. And when we are stripped bare of every weight and the sin, and sin that couldn't snare us or entangle us, we can look at the originator of our faith, Jesus Christ, the man, and imitate his life. Then and only then can we finish well. We look at Christ and say, this is what I want to imitate. The Bible says that. Do you know the Bible says that in Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God? No one has ever seen God, so it's pointing to Christ. Be imitators of God. If we say we're in Christ, we ought to walk as he walked. How do you imitate somebody? You act like they act. But if you don't know how he lived, you could never act like Jesus Christ. Everything else becomes like a story tell. Oh, I got a Bible. I read my Bible. These stories, are, these are more than stories. You can rest assured of that. You can rest assured of that. And so in verse 2, the writer says, look, looking, and it means fixing our gaze upon. Looking unto, did it say Calvary Chapel? Did it say Calvary Chapel in there? Does it say the pastor? Because some people love their pastor, and they make their pastors, I, I love my pastor. You should love your pastor. He's a shepherd, he feeds you. I hope y'all love me. I, that's the nice thing. But not looking unto me in that sense. Looking at me as an example, I'm sure. First Peter chapter 5, we should be examples to the flock of God. But here is this, this is the greatest one to look unto. Looking unto Jesus, and this is why. He's the, the author Archegos is the Greek word. Archegos means the pioneer or originator. In Acts 3.15, this word is translated to mean prince. Looking unto Jesus, the prince and finisher is the perfecter of our, the right includes himself, faith. So many people today in the church are not looking at Jesus. What does it mean to look unto Jesus? Placing your faith in him. Not a church building, not people, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfecter of our faith. That's why people go from one church to the next church. They look in a man. Well, nobody in here understand me and I'm going to this church. And nobody here can hug me the way I used to be hugged when I was a little kid at my grandfather's church. And nobody, you know, and they go from one church to the next church looking for something that don't even exist. Because if you're not looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, you'll fall short every time. You'll go to church. You may be happy there for five weeks or ten years. Then before you know it, this is not good enough. And then you'll go to the next church. Oh, man, they got everything I want right here. Then you'll find something wrong there. It's not good enough. You know why? Because you're not looking unto Jesus. 
When you're looking at a church or you're looking at to Jesus, you don't see mistakes. You see potential. You don't see problems. You see them being solved. You don't see you comparing yourself to another church. Well, they do that down there. We should do that. You don't see that. You say, Lord, I'm glad you made us different. It's how carnal we could be. Everything we see, we should try to do. Oh, man, they did this. Oh, they did that. Oh, oh boy. We can get so carnal like that. We'd be like, before you know it, you'd be like, well, what happened? They didn't do nothing I thought they should do because it's nothing like the place I just saw last week. The next week, you'll see somebody with a better picture frame. And then you go back and say, no, I see one even better. And the next week, you see another one better. He said, that's even better than the one I saw. And you'd be a confused person. Because everything you see will be comparing it to the wrong stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen? Come on, y'all acting like Presbyterians and like, amen? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And so many people today are not looking unto Jesus. They're placing their faith in uh, uh, not even a, a, a church building or something. But not Jesus. I love what Matthew writes in his gospel. Matthew says... He said, come, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, ye little faith, why did you doubt? See, whenever we look away from the Lord, we start to see the winds and the storms of life. We start sinking and we start doubting. Peter cried out, Lord, save me. He should have said that when he first got into the boat. Lord, let me keep my eyes just fixed on you, Lord. Jesus, if it's you, Lord, tell me. Give me the strength to keep my eyes fixed on you if it's you, Lord. Look into the author and the finisher of our faith. And look what it says in the other part of this verse. It says, who for the joy, joy is a good word, that was set before him, speaking of the cross, endured, it means to stay under or behind or to undergo, the cross, like I said earlier, Paul says, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. The cross that Jesus was crucified on was a wooden cross. He endured the cross. You say, well, did he endure the cross? He endured hanging on that cross. Not the walk to the cross, because remember, Simon Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, the Roman soldier tapped his shoulder with the javelin and he carried the cross to the crucifixion site. Remember that? So he endured the cross, but God used a criminal who was a guilty sinner to carry the cross because the one who went to the cross was innocent, but the one who carried it was a sinner. That's what it says, take up your cross daily and follow him. He had to have a sinner carry his cross because the Bible says he made him a new no sin. That's why he didn't carry his cross because he was innocent. And when he was nailed to that cross, he became the propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. The only sacrifice that could appease the wrath of, of Almighty Holy God was Jesus Christ on the cross. His shed blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In him we have redemption. We have been redeemed by the blood of a lamb. Not with the blood of goats and bullocks. You know, but the precious blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus Christ, as Peter says. Is Jesus Christ the holy righteous one. He endured the cross, the cross that Jesus was crucified, this wooden cross, as the Eastern tradition says, this pine or cypress or, you know, cypress or either cedar, whatever it was. It was a cross. And they nailed him to the cross. Nailed our Lord to the cross. And you know, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, it's interesting what Paul writes, I was just thinking about this. Well, I wasn't thinking about it. I guess the Holy Spirit must have been thinking about this. Because I wasn't really thinking about this. But when they nailed him to that cross, it says that as they nailed him to the cross, it says that he defeated Satan on the cross. Do y'all realize that? He defeated Satan on 
on the cross. That's what Jesus did when he was on the cross. He defeated the enemy. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Colossians. Church in Colossae. He said, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing, triumphing over them in it on the cross. Christ defeated the devil on the cross. You know that? Could you imagine the temptation the devil would have gave you in the garden against him? You're a fool to go to that cross. You ain't do nothing wrong. You had to be crazy. You read Psalm 22, it makes you shiver almost when he says, the bulls of Bashan, gaping, all type of demonic forces around that cross saying, come down from that, you got the power to do it. Even the people saying, you saved others, you save yourself. <laughs> you imagine that temptation? We would have been like, zap all, voo, voo. you know, we would have been blowing up the Roman whole government. They would have been gone. We wouldn't have been on that cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. We'd have been, oh, they know what they're doing. So, you know, blowing something up. That's what we would have did. We wouldn't have only said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. None of us. The first nail that went through my hand, I would, and I had power, they would have been smoked. And y'all know that. And he says, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, you know, suffering went with the shame. And even the cry that we will never have to cry out on that cross. You know what Jesus says? He's quoting Psalm 22. He says, my God, my God, why have thy forsaken me? You know, Mark says, Eloi, in Aramaic, he writes in Aramaic. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, why? And, and, and um, Matthew says, Eli, Eli. Lama Sabachthani. That means, my God, my God, why have thy forsaken me? Despising, you know, despising the shame that was before. You know, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Do you imagine that? The word despising is kataphrenio in the Greek. And it's a word that's interesting word. It's nine times in the New Testament. And it means to disdain, despise, contempt, think little or nothing of. He despising the shame <clears throat> and has sat down. No high priest has ever sat down, only Jesus, the Son of God. Because in the temple, there was no seats implying that the high priest's work was never finished. There was no seats. When they went into the Holy of Holies, and they went in, there were no seats there. No seats. But our high priest, who is Jesus Christ, sat down after his redemptive work was completed, after he said to tell us die, paid in full. After that, with his sacrifice being that, offered up for once and for all, it pleased and satisfied the wrath of God Almighty, the Lamb of God, the propitious one. He would, he would even say on the cross, it is finished. Paid in full. So he had to sit down. Now the writer lucid this back in Psalm in the Psalms, you know. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's what he's alluding to. He sat down in Psalm 110 and 1. He says, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till my, your enemies be made your footstool. So the writer says, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, the dunamis power, when he had made by himself, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. One writer wrote this. That the moment our Lord, before he sat down at the hand, the right hand of the throne of God, the Father, was from heaven to earth, to death and then to the resurrection, to ascension back to heaven, to exhortation. Knowing this, we all should be encouraged, knowing that we too will one day be in heaven. We too will be in heaven. So how are we going to finish our race? He is the perfect example. We should take up our cross daily and follow him. We should. We should. 
And if you're here tonight, you say, I'm struggling with my walk with Jesus Christ. I'm struggling. Should I follow the Lord? Just remember this noise. Those nails going through his wrist. And those thorns crowned on his head. You know what it makes me say? That it's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me. It's about him. It is a wonderful cross. It is a wonderful cross. Would you die for anybody? Anybody? Would you? I better not say that too loud. I remember the last time I said this lady curses all out. She said, I wouldn't die for nobody. And she didn't say those nice words. Who in here would die for somebody? The Bible says this. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. That's why we should be so thankful about the cross, because it saved us from the wrath of God. Because he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Paul says, Jesus, that Passover, he was the Passover lamb. When he see the blood. Where was the blood shed? At Calvary. On the cross, the skull, the Latin said, Golgotha. The skull, the, the place where Christ was crucified. The skull. You know, and, and we look at it and say, hey, wait, wait, man, look, I'm a Christian and I do what I want to do, man. Look, I, my time is my time. We get into all this stuff. You don't know. I do what I feel like doing, man. Look, I, I get to church. I'm going to get there when I get there. I'll serve. I want to serve. You don't understand the cross. You don't understand what Jesus did for you when you think that way. You don't understand the cross. You don't understand the paid sacrifice that he made for our sins. You don't understand that. Well, you stay church all day. Now, I was here early today by myself, praying. I said, Lord, it's just so nice to be here. And just stayed. I could have been gone. I stayed here for another hour after I had a meeting. I just stayed here and just sat in and prayed and said, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you let us do anything. What do you do at your church? Anything God want me to do? None of us are exempt for thinking like that. Whatever the Lord requires of you, you should be willing to do it. And that's anything he asks. You get a job description at work, it says up to and including. <laughs> so that means that anything we ask you to do at this job, you need to do it. And you just get a paycheck out the deal. Imagine laying up treasures in heaven. Don't lose your full reward, as it says in, in James' epistle, the second uh, epistle. Don't lose your full award, your full reward, rather. Don't. Because you know what you'll start thinking? Oh, this is my life. I'll do whatever I feel like doing. And you know the most miserable Christian? is the one that think they could do whatever they want to do. That's the most miserable Christian. That's the most miserable Christian because they think like their life is their life. No, your life was bought with a price. Do you, know, do you not know that you're the temple of God? He paid for it. Purchased with the blood of Christ. And you know this, so you got to know this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, we all belong to each other. That's what the body says. This ain't no secret Christian life. Oh, we people in my business. If you live that kind of Christian life, you're setting yourself up for sin. So where are you going now? Oh, I got something to do. Are we, oh, like, like, when you live that kind of life, you're setting yourself up for all the secret things that could creep in that will destroy you later on. I've seen it all the time. God said, I'm going, I got something to do. I'm going to such and such. And then you see him on the news. Remember one night, you remember the night I picked up this kid? And I remember I picked him and his mom up. Picked him up for church. Lived all the way out on the other side of town. Picked him up, drove him to church. And um, we just riding and he was saying all the right things. I said, something is not right with this. Something is wrong. 
And later on, you know, I get home, and on the news, he's on there robbing the store. I just dropped him off. I remember Sean said, you got to do something. I said, I'm not, you do something. You call the cops. I'm not calling no cops. You call them. They called him anyway. She tried to get me to call him. I don't know. So get thee behind me. I'm not doing nothing. Yeah. And in and, and our life sometimes, you could be that kind of person. It's kind of like you got your own life. It's private away from church. And at church, you kind of got a life here at church. And you say all the nice spiritual things. And you got the nice people in your neighbors. You don't even speak to your neighbors. The neighbors are good. Get on top. You, you, you shovel your pavement. You probably shovel up your step. And that's it. Or, and you don't, you don't care about nobody but yourself. And then you come into church and say, oh, praise the Lord, sister and brother. Hallelujah. Jesus is so good. He's on the main line. And don't even speak to anybody in the supermarket. Now, God has called us to be people that's open people. That our life is like a living book. Because Christ's life was a living book. And we have this book right here. Any secrets about his life? No. So as Christians, there shouldn't be any secrets about our lives. Amen? You don't have to say amen. Amen, Lord. Our lives should be an open book. A living letter, a living epistle being written, be ready and be written, no by men. That's what our lives should be like. And all that stubborn and that old stuff people got in their hearts, you better deal with that stuff yourself because that ain't Jesus. That's pride, self-centeredness. And I know exactly what I'm talking about. Our lives is just an open book for Jesus Christ. Open book. God's just thinking about my house on Mondays. I had nothing to hide. Oh, I had the liquor. I, I had none of that stuff in my house. I, you know, somebody, one guy used to drink all this stuff to pass the pastor knocking on his door. And the, he's, get the, get the liquor down. The, hide the liquor. Hide the brandy. Hide. He got all this stuff in his house. And this little kid come in. And as soon as the, hi, Pastor Johnson. Dad, why you hide your beard? Dad, Pastor Johnson might want one. <laughs> You know, that fast, the father said, what? What beer are you talking about, beer aspirin? No, beer. That's why it's a shame to live a double life. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up as we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for who you are, Lord. The wonderfulness of your goodness. The wonder of your love. Bless us, Lord Jesus. Bless us. Look to the cross tonight. The finished work of what you've done for us, Lord. Let us remember it, Lord. Lord, uh, look forward to Friday, Lord, communion and the day to, to do these things in remembrance of you, Lord. With the finished work, what you've done, let us preach, proclaim it until you come back. That you were the one crucified and buried and on the third day you rose from the dead. Lord, let us remember that. Let the world know that we are the church, the ecclesia. Let us shout to the world that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. His only dear Son, Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ. We love Jesus Christ. We believe that he's the Son of God. And then we believe, Lord, that he can do anything. More than a prophet, more than a preacher, more than a teacher, more than a priest, more than an apostle. He is Jesus Christ, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. So we honor you, Lord Jesus, we pray in your great name. You're wonderful. You're the great potentate. We honor your holiness. We pray in your great name, Jesus. Amen. Let's get a look. So glad you enjoyed the teaching today and hopefully the message we just shared ministered to you. And we have one more thing we would like to include. Um, it's the gospel, the good news about who Jesus Christ is and that how Christ was crucified and that on the third day he was raised from the dead and that you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, can give your heart to Jesus Christ. The Christ that loved you, the Christ that loved the world, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he loves us. He loves us so much that Jesus Christ came clothed in human flesh and died on the cross. And so look, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ today, 
Today is the time. The world has fallen apart. The only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. And so look, you can pray a simple prayer with me and invite him into your heart. You can say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that if I died right now, I would not go to heaven with you. Lord, I know, Lord, I need the forgiveness of my sin. Come into my life and save me and forgive me of all my sins and all I know to be wrong. And I believe by faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead for me. And if you invite him into your life right now, your life will change, your eternal destination will change. You'll be, with, you'll be with the Lord in heaven. It says absent from the body, present with the Lord. When you leave this earth, you'll be in the presence of God Almighty. And so look, give your life to the Lord today. He loves you. He has a plan for you. If you want more information about our church, you'll see it on the screen, our service times, and our location. Look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to seeing you.